because I know when I was setting my exams, I really struggled to leave on time. And then I really sort of bled into my study time. I wasn't studying as much as I wanted to. But in hindsight, when I really thought about it, there were definitely days where I could not leave on time for various external factors, but there were also a lot of days where I could have left on time if I had really committed to it and really put some boundaries in place and committed to leaving on time. And I think now I would regard that as self-sabotage. Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Dr. Beck. And I am Christine Barker. And this is Am I Doing It Wrong? A podcast for doctors by doctors. Dr. Beck is a mindset coach and medical doctor who specializes in liberating driven professional women from the limitations of perfectionism, imposter syndrome, and people pleasing. She's basically the cheat code for getting out of your own way, showing up authentically, and living a life you're proud of. And Christine is a medical educator educator and nephrologist who creates resources for doctors in training that I truly think are an unfair advantage. She makes complex topics super simple and takes the pain and uncertainty out of passing your medical exams. Christine and I connected a few years ago via our online platforms and over the years we've discussed countless highs, lows and in-betweens of doctor life and in doing so we've experienced firsthand the power of vulnerable conversations to show us where we get in our own way and underestimating our capacity. So we want you to be part of the conversation and experience these same results. Every week on the pod, we'll be bringing you conversations which shine light in dark places, normalize the doctor journey, ease unnecessary suffering, and give you actionable steps to thrive in all facets of your life. So grab a cuppa and get cozy for this week's episode of Am I Doing It Wrong? The podcast for doctors by doctors. Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome back to our party and the next episode of Am I Doing It Wrong? Fun. We were just talking about how much we are loving this process of making the podcast for you all and with each other. We hope that it's been impactful for all of you guys so far. And thank you for all of your, any of your comments, any of your interaction. And today on the pod, I'm so excited. We're going to be talking about (laughs) self-sabotage. And when we were talking about what we, some examples and things, I realized that I am the literal queen of (laughs) self-sabotage. So... I guess we can start with some of my examples. Um, So when what came to mind when we were talking about this, I actually think it's hard to conceptualize self-sabotage because from my own experience, it's actually really difficult in the moment to know when it's happening and when you're in your own way or not. It almost takes either the benefit of hindsight or someone else to come along and show you that you are self-sabotaging, right? And I know that you will unpack this in your the beautiful way you do with all of these more difficult concepts. But one example that I think a lot of doctors can relate to is not leaving work on time. And I was brainstorming this to make some content for for my audience who are setting their exams. Because I know when I was setting my exams, I really struggled to leave on time. And then I really sort of bled into my study time. I wasn't studying as much as I wanted to. But in hindsight, when I really thought about it, there were definitely days where I could not leave on time for various external factors, but there were also a lot of days where I could have left on time if I had really committed to it and really put some boundaries in place and committed to leaving on time. And I think now I would regard that as self-sabotage because what was truly happening was I wasn't leaving work on time and I would tell myself it was because I was doing such a good job. I was helping people and I was working really hard and I had a great work ethic and people needed me and I don't know, I just I thought I was doing a great job. But really it was an avoidance strategy because if I left work on time, I would then have to go home and actually study. And I guess, <laughs> Probably what was happening was, if I'm honest, it was good to have an excuse because otherwise all I had to fall back on was my own performance, right? So if I failed the exam, oh, it's because I was such a great doctor and I put my patients first and all of that jazz, right? As opposed to, you know, you failed because you didn't actually leave on time and go and do the work, right? So I think that's so hard to in the moment see for yourself because you convince yourself you're doing such a great job and the excuse seems so valid and true to you. So I'm curious what you think 
back about that because if you had to say that to me when I was a trainee, I would have been so upset with you. I'd be like, don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare point out my flaws. Um, <laughs> I would have been really, really upset. And I would have had definitely taken that on board. So now I can laugh about it. But what do you what do you think about that example? Can you relate to it? Or do you see this in your clients and things? <laughs> Firstly, this is a a, such a relatable topic to me included. I am constantly trying to monitor my mind to pick up on these, this tendency to self-sabotage because as much as it sounds like a, um, like a lose-lose situation to sabotage yourself, there are really, um, clean, simple explanations for why we are drawn to these self-sabotaging behaviors. And when you can understand your mind on that level, you recognize that these, these tendencies that our minds have means that we do need to be constantly on um, alert, sort of supervising our mind to interrupt those patterns. So, oh my goodness, you are, you are not alone. And I, I, I've got to tell you, you you're not going to be the queen of self-sabotage. <laughs> You you just you can't take that crown. There are too many of us that are way too too good at I don't want a crown of some sort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's organize a different one for you. When you give that scenario where um you choose to leave, choose to stay at work longer, um, with all the reasoning that you have about why that's a good thing to do juxtapose with the other option you have of going home to study this will just this this beautiful scenario shows you the differences in what's emotionally available to you with these two options and this is the first thing that i'd really like people to start to um think about and develop in terms of skills in their lives and this is emotional intelligence emotional awareness because when we look at these two scenarios and we're like why is christine sabotaging herself she's got important things to do she's got an exam to study for she really wants to pass the exam but when you look at the emotional component of this situation it's very clear why christine would be doing this so you've got one situation where you stay in the hospital and because you have the thoughts about staying in the hospital that are I am a good doctor for doing this. This is the this is a noble thing to do. This is the right thing to do. This is me doing the best thing for my patients. And sorry, I paraphrased all of those thoughts. But that's the the general gist is I'm doing a good thing. In line with what Christine's idea of a good thing is ethically, morally. Those thoughts make her feel good. Right? Staying in the hospital not going to study makes her not just feel neutral, but it actually makes her feel really good when it means all of those things about her. Going home, on the other hand, I'm sure that we don't need much imagination for this scenario. You've got these expectations of how much study you have to do. You will probably have all these judgments about how much study you've already, that you should have already done and where you actually should be right now, but you have to sit down and face the fact that you're not there. You're not meeting those expectations. And then you have to do the difficult work, the challenging work of focusing your mind in that moment and pushing through all of these decisions and new concepts and incongruencies in your mind as you learn this new content. And that in itself, that like hour, a couple hours, goodness, some people study to like through the evening, how many hours, whether it's 10 minutes or many hours of study, that is likely in our minds, we're going to anticipate that being uncomfortable. Now, the general operating of a human being is that we are always moving towards what feels good. That's all we want as humans. It's the reason that we do everything we do ever because we want to feel better. We always want to feel better. So if your mind is presented with these two options, stay in the hospital and feel good, even though, you know, she's, Christy's doing all this other crazy hard work in the hospital. She's probably exhausted, burnt out, da, da, da. That good, albeit how small the good might be, still feels better than the option to go home and face the study. So there's nothing mysterious um, happening in this scenario. But unless we can look at it from this perspective of 
this human psychology, the, the, the motivational triad, we're always moving towards what feels good and moving away from what feels bad and doing that in the most efficient way. This, it can be easy to miss how our mind is making this calculation in this moment. But I hope that um, I think that gives us a really important place to start because we are not these logical, rational beings in our moment to moment lives as we think we all are. And so this self-sabotage, it's not, it's not us looking at what's on offer and deciding on what's best and deciding to sabotage, but instead it's us just deciding to feel good in that moment. And that happens to be a sabotage in terms of our ultimate goal. How does that align with your experience? And is there anything that you think um, doesn't quite line up or feels different? Yeah, no, you've hit the nail on the head. Definitely choosing what feels good versus what feels bad. Um, because I was just thinking there as you were saying that, that even on the days that I did leave work on time enough to sort of squeeze in some study, I would then get to the desk and be unable to study, <laughs> which is probably a whole other layer of being the queen of sabotage, right? So um, I do want the crown. I, f I feel like I've earned it, okay? So <laughs> the queen. So I would then sit at my desk and be like, right, now I have time to study. Oh, good. And then I'd just be like, oh, I feel incapable of this. Like either I would be trying to watch a college lecture and couldn't pay attention or I just felt slow because I kept having to pause the lecture to take in that one slide. And I just felt like, what is what is wrong with me that I can't take in this information? Um, or I would try an MCQ and not manage it. I, like my brain was just exhausted from not only trying to study, but just the realization that I was kind of struggling to study. And I'm interested in, is that self-sabotage or is that just being tired and I should just have picked another day to, you know, but I, I can imagine how maybe having had that experience the next day, I would then choose to stay late and be that sort of inverted commas doctor hero rather than trying to do the study thing again because it did feel so terrible. So what's happening there when I'm, I'm studying and I'm just I'm all over the place? OK, firstly, sitting down to open those college lectures. <laughs> Yuck. Some of them are just so, so discomfort inducing. <laughs> I sort of always experience, I always expect this experience of sitting down to watch a lecture and having the information so beautifully and logically laid out that I just go from slide to slide and I'm like, that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm piecing these new facts together. I'm piecing this new concepts together. And that's sort of my expectation of the lectures. But wow, when you you sit down to watch some of these lectures they are not they're not this beautiful conceptual piece of art they are you know one slide that you need to sit down and you need to piece together the concept yourself and work out what piece of information goes where and what's relevant and what's not i find that i find these lectures really um a lot of them very surprising in those ways and it's in part because you know they're by a different um, lecturer almost every time. There's maybe a, a couple of the college lecture series that have the same teacher and sometimes they're clearly an excellent teacher or I should say a teacher that resonates with my learning style and sometimes they don't seem to have a, a teaching style that is logical to me and I have to do a lot more work. So instantly you set that expectation of like, I'm, I'm going to take 90 minutes to do this lecture, but it ends up taking five hours because it's more work than you anticipated. Oh my goodness, Christine. That is why I love your content. By the way, <laughs> your content, your lecture series are, they just, my, they make my mind so happy. <laughs> I feel like I just get to sit back and watch the concept unfold. And I just have this aha after aha after aha moments. So thank you so much <laughs> on that note for the way that you make lectures. I am so grateful. <laughs> Now, the big sidetrack. So what I was saying there was how just resonating with how uncomfortable these lectures can be. And again, at, firstly, at any moment, you've, you've made your way to your Jessica, they're sitting down, but you still have these options, you know, and one of the tactics that you can ultimately do with mind management is take away the other options, right? Not have yourself distracted by other options. But in that very moment, you're sitting down at your desk to study and you can either 
sit down and continue to study, or you might be aware that you can do any other number of things around your house. That would feel better than the study right now, right? And this is where the phenomenon of procrastinating cleaning comes in. You guys are like, I just, I don't know what it is. I must just be a clean freak. I just need to have a clean house to be able to study. And I call, I'm calling this out guys. <laughs> you do not love cleaning. If you had uh, like three weeks off, <laughs> you probably wouldn't choose to spend every day cleaning. <laughs> It's just because, again, that feels better than the study. It's all relative, whatever feels better. That's why you can be so hyper, hyper, hyper productive when you have to study because it's not that you love cleaning. It's not that you need a clean space or whatever, but it's because that feels emotionally better than the study. <laughs> I feel like that's touching a touching a nerve there, Christine. It really is. And it feels so good just to scoosh something and wipe it. And it just, it feels great. It feels great. But I have this thing with procrastinating cleaning where I know I do it. I know I've always got laundry to do when something uncomfortable comes up. But also it is true that if I have a decluttered space, my brain is happier. And I, I had this thing recently with, um, when I was on ward service, I had like a state of chaos, we'll call it, domestic chaos compared to my usual. And I remember just feeling really like, anxious and this is about off topic but I was anxious and it's just there was this kind of vibe that I didn't really like about myself and I came in from my Saturday wardrobe and I was like you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna clean the house and do you know how much better I just felt like but I don't know what that was I don't know if that was connected to self-sabotage that day or whether I just felt more in control and I guess that's well maybe that is the same thing when you feel in control you feel good and so yeah, being in control, being on top of things, convincing yourself that you're actually a really organized person. So there's no intrinsically good or bad activities or circumstances, but there's just the way that we think about them because that is what determines the way that we feel. So you genuinely do feel good. Let's even say you genuinely may be more productive when you have this clean space. And that can be, you can understand why that can happen because you are more productive because in your behavior, because you're in an emotional state that was fueling that productivity, coming from a thought that everything is perfect for study. I'm ready to study. All I need to focus on right now is study. You know, whatever those thoughts are that a clean space um, prompts your mind to think. So there is absolutely merit, you know, in having the clean space. And honestly, it helps me too to have a clean space, i.e. it helps me to have thoughts that are conducive with me behaving in a way that makes me more productive, makes me study, right? But what I want you guys to pick up on is that it's not necessary because I don't want you to be disempowered and believe that you can't study unless your space is clean because then you will end up cleaning before you start studying. You will not by choice, but by this false idea, you'll think that I can't study unless my space is clean. When perhaps when you step back and you're in an empowered place, you're like, I've got one hour. The most important thing for me to do in this time is study for that hour as opposed to clean for half an hour and then study for half an hour. And I just want everybody to have that choice and not be tricked by these thoughts that only take away your choices. Does that make sense? Yes. And then, so my next question is, I mean, I think some of these examples are probably really resonating with um, with these guys, you know, like with their doctor humans listening. Let us know guys comment down below procrastinating cleaning do you need a do you need a clean space do you just love cleaning when it's time to study do you think you could take my crown basically <laughs> <laughs> who gets the crown comment down below um, but yes yeah, so we've got avoiding leaving work on time and um, we've got procrastinating cleaning um what other how how do we know that we're in our own way are there any other scenarios that come up or any tips you have for just recognizing or really being honest with yourself when you are 
self-sabotaging. It's so hard to catch in the moment. Do you have any tips on that? This is, again, this is something that I'm constantly working on too. And it's, it's, you need, what it all comes back to is that ability to supervise your mind and recognize your emotional state. Because, so we know that we'll be reaching constantly towards what feels good. That's our mind's natural tendency. The motivational triad again is that we will be motivated to move towards what feels good, away from what feels bad or pain, and to do that in the most efficient way, i.e. usually to repeat patterns that we've already done before or things that we know. So knowing that your emotional state is determined by your thoughts. So when you are having, for example, these thoughts about how, and Christine, you said some of these when you were you were giving us the scenario of sitting down at your desk and talking about the, the college lecture series. <laughs> You're thinking, you know, uh, and I can't remember your thoughts, sorry, but maybe like some thoughts that resonate with me are like, I'm not getting this. I should know this by now. I should be further along by now. I wanted to finish this lecture an hour ago, those sorts of thoughts. These thoughts can potentially be self-sabotaging. Why? Because when I think those thoughts, and this is what you need to check, but when I think those thoughts, they create an emotional state in me of, uh, let me just, I, sh- I should, I wanted to have this done an hour ago. Frustration. Um, this isn't making sense frustration. Um, I'm never going to get this done. (sighs) Disappointment, defeated. I'm tired, defeated. So let's even just look at that little group of thoughts and the emotions that I experience when my mind offers those thoughts. So now I'm set out to do my task of studying with these extra challenging emotional states of frustration, defeatedness, and disappointment. I want you to juxtapose that with what else is available to you during this time, or even think about What is the place that you do your best study from? What is the place that you do your best learning from, that you do your best planning from, that you make your best overall life decisions from in terms of what what you prioritize in the moment? Even including, is this a time that I wanna rest? Am I tied to the point that the best thing for me to do right now is rest? Or is studying the right thing for me to do right now? Disappointment, defeatedness, what was my other emotion? Oh, frustrated, yeah. (laughs) I can't remember. You guys get the picture though, right? (laughs) Trying to study from those emotions versus what else is available to me, which is calm, focus, determined, for example. You can see how, you know, those two contrasting situations in this second situation, you are not going to perform. We're all different, but in general, you're not going to perform as well in either the actual study, the actual learning and integration or in the planning and prioritizing your your whole life study scenario from these emotions. And these emotions in themselves activate your sympathetic nervous system. And that in itself is tiring too. It spends more energy and it affects the way that your, your brain cognitively functions. So it affects how well you learn. Literally, acute stress decreases the blood flow to your prefrontal cortex at the very least, you know, in the most simplest way to say, to demonstrate that even acute stress, not just chronic stress, but acute stress doesn't help you think and learn. You want your prefrontal cortex in maximum functioning capacity when you're learning new and novel information. You don't want to be down in those lower brain basal ganglia circuits where you're repeating old patterns. It's the opposite. You're trying to learn new things. So you want all that blood flow to your prefrontal cortex, right? So that is not the state that most people want to be in when they're studying. So this is the way that our self-doubting and self-critical thoughts are self-sabotaging. We so commonly, 99% of people will explain to me that, in fact, I don't think I've even had one person 
give me the opposite scenario. They tell me that their self-doubting and self-critical thoughts are really useful when it comes to study, that it motivates them and it helps them see where their problems are and their deficits are. But when you look at how those thoughts affect how you feel and how that affects your behavior, it becomes very obvious that they're not useful. So there's another layer to this too of, you know, I've had, I've had the most, a client who's just kicking goals recently. And so she has got this concept in the bag. She's previously been someone who's been highly critical of herself and constantly doubting. She's coming up to her fellowship exams now. And she came to the session with this realization that she's never had before, which is, I don't want these self-doubting and self-critical thoughts in my study routine. They are not useful to me. I want to study and plan from a different place. So she's got that background in the bag. And for, for a lot of us, uh, for most of us, getting to that recognition, having that level of self-awareness will take time. So it's okay if you don't fully believe that right now. I'm just going to continue with this example to show you how this plays out. So she came to the session and she was like, so I'm having these thoughts and um, I'm suffering with these emotions. I know that I don't want them. So we start from there. Now, instead of just what we would commonly do in this scenario, which is sort of fight against these thoughts and wish them away, even though they're there in our mind, a useful approach to disarm the thoughts and therefore not be stuck with those emotions and the behavioral responses is to have some level of compassion for your brain, right? Not change your thoughts by force, but kind of getting on the same team, getting, you know, all aspects of your mind, the afraid part of your mind and the de determined, empowered part of your mind on the same page and on the same team here, because it's the afraid part of your mind that's offering those self-doubting and self-critical thoughts. Why is it doing this? So when we do these self-sabotaging behaviors with every behavior that we do, even if it feels bad, there is a payoff. There's always a payoff. And when you look for the payoff, you'll start to understand your, the decisions that your mind is making and you're in a better position to actually negotiate with your mind instead of just being this, you know, um, this dismissive mentor or parent or dictator of your mind and just telling it that it's bad and what not to do. But in this case, we can see your mind is actually trying to protect you with this self-sabotage. Your mind is trying to protect you with these self-doubting and self-critical thoughts because that afraid part of your mind is anticipating that you're not going to get the result that you want. Here, it's anticipating that you are not going to pass your exam. Now, if you self-sabotage in this moment, i.e. you don't prepare as much as you plan to, you tell yourself that you have all these other priorities that need to be attended to, cleaning, patience, um, whatever else takes away your time and energy or resources from the study, then when, in your mind, when you don't pass the exam, you get to say, oh, but it's because I didn't have enough time. Oh, it's because I had these other priorities. Oh, it's because I, you know, if I had more time or if I didn't have those other priorities, then I would be able to pass the exam. Those excuses don't seem useful, but you know what they do? They actually protect your identity as somebody who can pass the exam. They protect your plans for the future. They protect your goals and what you want for the future because you can say, it's okay, I didn't pass my exam, but it's still possible for me because I can spend more time studying next time. I can prioritize things differently next time. It leaves some room for you to keep believing in your identity. We never want to stray as humans from our identity. Look at this from the other perspective of Imagine if you got to the end of your exam, you didn't pass, and then you had the thought, I did everything that I could do. There's nothing more I could have done. And I still didn't pass. 
we think that we want to believe that, that there's nothing else that we could do. That's what we think we want to believe, that we did our best, we worked as hard as we could, we think that that would make us feel proud. But actually, that can make us lose hope. It can make us lose our identity. It can make us lose our, our whole plans for our life and our future, right? So as much as we think we want to think that we did everything we could and we worked as hard as we could, that comes at a cost too. And that part of your mind that is trying to, that is self-sabotaging right now, it's creating this little library of excuses for you to protect your identity when, quote, in your mind, you're anticipating you're going to fail, when you fail. So that's a lot. <laughs> Christine, can you tell me where you're at? Oh my goodness, my mind is blown. Oh, so, I mean, it's amazing how deep that runs. And I really wish that I'd had you when I was setting my exams. Because what you're basically telling me is that, yes, I can fully concur with that. You want to not fall apart if you do fail. So you construct this narrative, probably some in your subconscious that you can't actually hear those thoughts, but they're definitely happening and they're causing these behaviors. But equally, you've said that there is a way to, if you can tune into this and sort of call it out and shine a bit of light on it, you have the opportunity to actually feel better whilst you are studying for your exams or whatever your goal is. So I, I, we could apply this to exams. You could apply it to exercise goals and not go to the gym and it, whatever it is. Whatever it is that you're giving yourself an excuse for in the moment to protect your identity for who you want to become, but equally if you can sort of conceptualize this and bring these thoughts up in yourself and be honest with yourself, you actually have this opportunity for change to be able to sit down and have a study session where you do sit down, you've got an hour and you boss life and you're open. Like you say, your sympathetic nervous system is quiet, your parasympathetic's on, so you're actually gonna learn. <laughs> and that can become your absolute superpower is just knowing this about yourself, understanding how your brain is working against you but kind of for you as well. It's trying to protect you, but it's maladaptive. And so I feel so full of hope because you're basically saying, if I really look at this in myself, I can feel better doing the harder thing. And so even if I did fail, the journey is gonna be a lot more pleasant. <laughs> Would that be a fair account of what you're saying? Absolutely, and even if you take it further, what are you protecting yourself from at the end? What is this self-sabotage protecting you from? It's protecting you from your thoughts about yourself in that future moment. It's protecting you from how mean and judgmental you're going to be when, in quotation marks, you know, that's what our, our brain's worried about, when you don't pass your exam. You're protecting yourself from you. Now, if you were the kind of person who you, or you were in the mindset of failing, not meeting an expectation and then not making that about you, not making that mean something definitively, factually about what you're capable of now and in the future, there would be nothing to protect from. There'd be no reason to self-sabotage, right? Because if you know that you're going to treat yourself well, no matter what the outcome, you are free to just study to make decisions about however you want to spend your time without the fear about what it's going to mean when you do or don't pass. There's no need for self-sabotage anymore. So to me, that's the sort of ultimate, um, that's the ultimate change that I'd love to see people make here. And that, that is the perfectionism mindset in itself. You know, the way that I describe perfectionism is when our expectations, when our reality doesn't meet our expectations, the judgment that we have about that, when the judgment is personal and pessimistic, that's a, per, that's a perfectionistic mindset. You know, when we make it mean something about ourselves personally, that is highly pessimistic, that's a perfectionist, per, perfectionistic mindset. So when you're somebody who fails an exam and then makes it mean that you are bad and the future will be bad, that you can't have what you want in the future, now you need to try and protect yourself from that judgment, right? If you're somebody who's not perfectionistic in that moment when you don't pass your exam, you have nothing to protect yourself from. You get to see that, that 
failure, if you want to call it that, or simply you see that situation where you didn't meet the expectation and you make it mean something different. I did everything I could this year. For example, I did everything I could and it wasn't enough this year. There are also lots of things that are out of my control. I'm still going to stay true to what I want right now and in my lifetime, which is to pursue this specialty. So I'm going to sit the exam again next year regardless. I'm going to use whatever I learned from this time. It might be something, it might be nothing. But you're going to sit the exam again next year regardless. You see, that's actually available to us, but it's, it's not truly available to many of us in the current way that we're thinking right now. But with, with mind management um, tools and skills and with coaching in particular, you can get to that place. You can just charge forwards in your life without having to protect yourself from yourself. <laughs> it's incredible. And I've said it once and I'll say it a million times. You are a thought wizard. <laughs> oh my God, that sounds like a superpower that I want to have. And I mean, I think obviously that this is what you do. You get people to that stage, don't you? Where they're actually like living and breathing what you just said. Um, and I think like it was comforting to know like what you said. It's not um, everything it's not going to happen overnight. And I guess if you're not there right now, like that's also okay. You'd have to beat yourself up for that. But I think understanding that there is another way to be is just therapeutic in itself, you know, in terms of, of what we could do. Yeah. And actually with saying that too, you, it's, I would expect, even if you're the kind of person who doesn't have that perfectionistic mindset at the end, I would still expect that there would be something to grieve because I think, you know, the other thing that happens when your reality doesn't meet your expectations is there is a sense of loss. You lost, you are holding onto that expectation for yourself and you, you cannot hold onto that version of the future anymore or the present. And so you can still feel bad in the setting of these quote failures or when your expectations aren't met, you can still feel bad and grieve and with whatever negative emotions that comes from. And that's a part of having a very human and also resilient mindset. That's a part of it. You're still going to feel, I would still expect to feel some badness, but it's very different from the badness that comes from these thoughts about how um, there's something personally wrong with you and the lie that this shows you that you'll never get what you want in the future. So it's not supposed to be, it will never be all sunshine and rainbows, but this mindset that is not perfectionistic, it just unlocks so much productivity and also joy in the moment in a space where, you know, we'd otherwise have those emotions of frustration, disappointment and defeatedness. They were the three <laughs> that came straight to me. And I guess I can imagine that a lot of people listening will be resonating with that perfectionistic or not. Like they will put themselves into that category and they'll be resonating with that aspect of themselves. But I also think that there could be some people who may not still be listening who are incredibly triggered by this conversation. And so regardless of whether you're resonating with what we're saying or whether you're triggered, I mean, especially if you're triggered, that would have been past me. Um, I think that you need to like listen to this again and see if it does apply to you because if you're triggered by us saying oh you're not leaving work on time because you're self-sabotaging as opposed to external factors then you could need this more than anyone because I definitely need this more than anyone I would have never ever ever identified with this at the time at all so I think just to say that to you if this is sparking an emotion within <laughs> It might be a, a, it might mean it is relevant to you. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny actually, Christine, this is really topical because I feel like at like almost half a dozen times over the last week with my clients, whether they're one-on-one -on -one or from group, I've, I've had these like testimonials and feedback and things like that. And so many times over the last couple of weeks, I've heard I was skeptical at first. And I'm like, I just forget that sometimes that um, before you really apply this work and you see it play out in your life, the, the current state for most of us when we hear new information or a new way of thinking about things is skeptical. So if you're there, there's nothing's going wrong. But if you turn away from this, if you stay in that skeptical place, all it means is that this work isn't available to you. So you're doing this for you this is just an option for you that you get to try on and you get to see does this have something to offer me that's not a leading question the answer might not be yes and that's okay but 
don't let any levels of skepticism or resistance or whatever else comes up in that sort of a triggered state don't let that be your final answer if you you know that life can be better for you if you know that you want a version of living that gives you a better balance of challenge but also success because you know I, I can't even remember my life before I understood my mind well but I knew that um, I know that I had a lot of pain and now I can see a lot of that pain was absolutely unnecessary and I had so much more to offer the world and I had so much more enjoyment to get out of my life that I was neglecting for years and years and years on end. So I, I love how you said this, Christine, if you get some kind of emotional reaction, positive or negative to this, then get interested in it because there might be something here for you. Well, we are at time and we would love to hear from you guys as always. I'm just going to jump over to YouTube and see we've got people watching. Hello guys. Oh, hi. So what do you guys think? Is um, self-sabotage something that you have in your life? Are you going to take Christine's crown? <laughs> <laughs> comment comment with a crown emoji to let us know if you think you are worthy of taking her crown <laughs> <laughs> i think the only other thing um to see on top of what you just said was i can really vouch for having had i've been dabbling in your work just having known you and tried some of your group coaching and things and what i've really noticed is that it's not like you don't have those painful things come up like you don't have it's not like you have no struggles but the cycle of the length of time that it affects you is much shorter so that you have the pain and the human moment and me, 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 and I have like a little gremlin and then you're like oh what's making me like this and then you kind of you can climb out of it so much faster than I mean I didn't have any when I was doing my exams I really it just felt terrible and there was no end <laughs> to that feeling and I was just a constant cycle sat the exam thank god it's over but there was no there was no reprieve so if I had met you before if I had this to listen to I really do think I would like to think that it would have changed that experience for me and I just really hope that it it, this finds whoever it needs to find because there are other queens of sabotage out there that are past me <laughs> it's out there <laughs> and um, I really hope this helps you Beck is a wizard and you've been so generous with um sharing all your know-how and how we can sort of help ourselves through these times so thank you Beck. oh Christine it's such a pleasure and I just I always love hearing your perspective on these topics too because you really bring you bring these specific experiences to life and you come from this very interesting perspective that is you've been there and you are not only analyzing how that could have gone differently but how you can take those past experiences and make them better in your life because you're not somebody even though your exam is done you're somebody who continues to take on crazy challenge after crazy challenge after crazy challenge in your life I still have to watch the college lectures because I have to know the rough <laughs> what the MCQs are going to look like and I still have to pause about three million times that's still my reality yeah they're the worst oh no no I'm not criticizing them in that way no it's just they're very dense <laughs> no they're just very dense aren't they they're just fact after fact after fact and you're like oh. that's it's such an important thing isn't it that it's it's about your learning style mm -hmm. yeah unfortunately the college learning series just gives you like take it or leave it this is the content and you can learn it in this style that we've given you but um you know there's other ways to learn guys and so go and find christine's page because she matches my learning style perfectly <laughs> but even if you don't do that just leave work on time and just you know just that's that's the main thing <laughs> Get out of your own way. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Meg, and thank you so much to everyone listening. I hope this helps, and I hope you have a great week. Bye, everyone. Bye. I've been waiting all my life for something. I've been down the darkest roads and up in the clouds. But I've always felt that something's missing. That was until.